Okay, let's start, inshallah, it's 8.05. Inshallah, there's more people that can join us as we've already started. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa ala alihi al-tayyabin al-tahirin. Actually, there's an attendance sheet. I'll just go get it. Get started, inshallah. Um, Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Before I start today, I wanted to narrate a story about a, a great scholar. Normally, we don't hear about female scholars, but this is a, an individual who was a very eminent scholar of the Shia community. Uh, her name was Banu Amin Isfahani. So today in particular, our discussion around these pages 36 to 40 from Surah Al-Baqarah will pertain to divorce and marriage. And specifically since there is a discussion about the rights of men and women, I wanted to emphasize this point in the beginning with this story that definitely, undoubtedly, in the eyes of Allah, in terms of the value that a human being has, there's no difference between a man and a woman. Yeah, both of them have that honor of being a servant of Allah. Both of them have that honor and that opportunity of attaining proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In that sense, a woman who is a servant of Allah is a role model for everybody. Okay, This is there in the Holy Quran in Surah um, Talaq or Tahrim, one of those surahs, there is like at the end of the surah there is a Bibi Maryam and Bibi Asiya are presented as role models for all mankind. And so in that sense, there's no doubt that in terms of their opportunity to attain proximity to Allah, there is no difference between a man and a woman. However, as we're going to read today in Surah Al-Baqarah, in terms of their role in society, in terms of their role in a marriage, in a family, there is a difference. And the Sharia does not treat them both the same. Okay, this is something that we have to recognize and accept. And so I wanted to give a story of a great individual called Banu Amin Isfahani. Okay, she was a scholar who was from Isfahan, who passed away about 40 years ago. She's buried in Isfahan, this is her. She wrote a, a tafsir of the Qur'an amongst other books. She's maybe the only female scholar we have who has written a complete dore, a complete kind of book of tafsir. Her tafsir is called Tafsir Makhzan al Arfan. In Farsi, uh, she's written this tafsir. She was somebody who, in those days, like, you know, maybe like a hundred years ago, imagine she attained ijtihad. She studied in the Hawza and she had different um, kind of degrees of ijtihad and narrating hadith from eminent scholars. Nowadays, even for a lady to do this in the Hawza is hard. I can't imagine how hard it must have been back then. And so let me just narrate one story about her that one of the ulama narrates that he was once having a conversation with Banu Amin and she was narrating to him certain spiritual realities that had been unveiled for her. And she told this scholar that every time the angel of death comes to take somebody's life from this city that I live in, from this area that I live in, I am aware of that. I know that the angel of death is coming. I know whose house he's going to and whose, whose life he's going to take. So this person was shocked, the, the person she was talking to, who's narrating the story, and he asked her that, how did you attain this high level, and how are these spiritual realities unveiled for you? And in response, she said that it was because of her uns with the Holy Qur'an. She was somebody who had memorized the Qur'an from a young age, and she said, the more and more I would kind of drown myself in the Qur'an, the more these spiritual realities were unveiled for me. So I wanted to start off with that story just as a reminder that when we talk about the, uh, you know, hukuk and the kind of role difference between men and women in Islam, we don't mean in any way to put down women or, or say anything to kind of reduce the status of women in Islam. Nonetheless, inshallah, in this discussion today that we're going to go through, so that's pages 
36 to 40. Um, the end of page 35, which is verse number 224. And then on the top of page 36, there is a discussion of yameen, or making a, an oath. Yameen means like a, a pledge, a promise. So I wanted to kind of give a little bit of a fiqhi overview of this discussion. And then we will go into uh, one of the discussions that is similar to divorce called ila. Again, I'll talk about that. And then I think after that, there is a lengthy discussion about divorce. So from about page 36, 37, and then even going into 38, there is a discussion of divorce and some of the ahkam of divorce and the custody of the child in the case of divorce. So these are some of the fiqhi discussions that we'll go through today. Um, yeah, and there's stuff maybe related to that as well, but I think largely we'll focus on these different discussions. Again, we kind of see like in the last few sessions, we've gone through so many different fiqhi discussions. There's been references to fasting, references to hajj, references to qisas. And so it's kind of beautiful to see how the Holy Qur'an touches on many of these important fiqhi discussions. Although it doesn't give us a complete picture of the ahkam, it's not a book of ahkam, but at the same time, in order to understand the Holy Qur'an, we need to have some familiarity with the sharia, with the ahkam. And so that just at least that gives us an idea of the importance of the ahkam. So before we start going into verse 224 and 225, let me give you guys a quick overview of uh, this discussion of an oath in Islam. Okay, So in the chapters of fiqh, we have a discussion of three different kinds of oaths that somebody can make. Oath here maybe is not the right word. It's more like a pledge, a promise to do something. Okay, We have one that's called another. Undoubtedly, you're familiar with this. There's another one that's called an ahad, and there's another one that's called yameen. So this yameen is what is being referred to in these verses 224 and 225. So all of them are a kind of wajib, something that you can say that I promise I'm going to do this. And by saying it, it becomes wajib upon you. If you break that promise, there is a specific kafara that you have to pay, a specific penalty you have to give. But there are subtle differences between the ahkam of these three and the way that they are actually realized. Okay, The way that you make another versus the way that you make an ahad versus the way that you make a yameen is different, which I'll, I'll quickly clarify. And one, one other difference between these three is that yameen is actually a term used for different things. First of all, the word yameen is also sometimes, the, this yameen is sometimes called a qasam, or sometimes it's called a hilf. These are all the same thing. And so, in the sense that, you know, all of these three are something that you can make a pledge, a promise to Allah that I'm going to do something, in that sense, they're all similar, and but that is only one of the types of a yameen. Okay, so yameen can also be done to kind of swear that something had happened in the past. Okay, so there's three different types of yameen. One is to do with the past, that I swear by Allah that I saw Zaid. I swear by Allah I didn't do this. You go to court, at times in the Islamic court, you need to, uh, you may be called upon to witness something and you may have to make such a qasam okay so in that sense that's one of the types of yameen sometimes yameen are also used to request something that oh i swear by allah please give me some food i need food for example that's the second type so it's like a request but the third type is the one that we're talking about where you're making a, a you're swearing by allah that i'm going to do something in the future okay so that third type is very much like an ahad and another but like I said, they all have their own sigha. So for another, you would say, for example, Lillahi alayya. 
I, like I, by Allah, this is wajib on me that I'm going to fast for three days, for example. I'm going to pray ten rakats of prayer. And in all of these, the nadr, the ahad, and this type of yameen, you can do it in a conditional sense that, it, you know, oh Allah, if I pass my test, I make another that I'm going to fast for three days. Or, oh Allah, if I... So that's like, you know, you, you're you asking Allah to help you to fulfill a hajat that you have. And so in that sense, you make another, or you make an ahad, or you make a yameen. Sometimes, no, it might be done so that you want to hold yourself back from something. You want to stop smoking. So you say, I make another lillahi alayhi. Every time I smoke, I'm going to fast one day. Be careful when making such nathars. You know, like it's very serious. At times, people take it lightly and then they put themselves through a lot of difficulty or they end up having to pay a kafara. Um, but yeah, so they have their own sigha. The, the sigha for another would be specifically something like that. In Arabic, you would say, Lillahi alayya. But there may be other other sighas as well, and it doesn't have to be in Arabic. You can just do it in English even. I Like, for the sake of Allah, it is wajib on me that I'm going to fast for three days. That would be another. The, uh, when you're doing an ahad, it has specifically the word ahad in it. So you say like, Ahadullah. I make an ahad with Allah that I'm going to do this. And for a yameen, it's basically a swearing in the name of Allah with, for example, Wallah, Billah, Tallah. That I, Wallah, I'm going to do this. Okay? So all of them at the end of the day, they're very similar, but there are subtle differences. One of the important differences is that uh, all three of them, you can never make a, another or an ahad or a yameen to do something that is bad in the sharia. You can never say, I swear by Allah, I'm going to not pray namaz shab namaz shab is something mustahab. You can't do something makruh, let alone something haram, and make a nadr about it, or a ahad about it, or a qasam about it. However, there's a discussion about whether there's something that's not at all good or bad. It's totally like the Sharia doesn't mind if you do it or not. Okay, like let's say like I don't know, drinking five cups of water every day. It doesn't really matter. It's not something mustahab. It's not something makruh. If you can give it some kind of istihbab and say that okay, I want to drink five cups of water so that I become healthy, so that I can serve Allah then definitely you can do it for all three of them. But if there is absolutely no reason to say that in the eyes of the Sharia, it is something good, then for another or a yameen, it's invalid to do that. But for an ahad, it's okay. Just a subtle, this is one of the ahkam, where an ahad can be done about something that is completely like you know, equal. It's not necessarily good, not necessarily bad. But for another and yameen, one of the conditions is that it has to be something good in the eyes of Islam. If you guys have any questions, feel free to ask. Otherwise, we can go into uh, these verses and inshallah, they'll make more sense. Now. When you say these things in your mind, it doesn't count? No, no, it doesn't count. Ahsant, yeah. If you just make it, a lot of people don't know this. If you just think about it or even make the plan to do it, it doesn't count. You have to actually say this sigha. That lillahi alayya with like as we'll see in the verse with other conditions like you know like you you really intended it if you just say it as a joke all of these things in the sharia like they you know they only apply if they're actually done with aql with ikhtiyar with so like with you know like somebody who's got an intellect they know what they're doing intentionally intending to do that they say that thing then it would apply <laughs> Yeah, so then again, there's a discussion. An ahad, the kafara for an ahad is like the kafara of breaking a fast in the month of Ramadan. The kafara for a yameen is less heavy. It's it's in the Holy Quran as well. It's like um, fast three days or feed like six people or seven people or clothe them. No, no, it's actually there's a different... Um, 
this it's actually two levels like is if you can you fast uh, you feed the poor people or clothe them and if you're not able to then you just fast for three days okay so basically the kafara for a yameen is lighter than the kafara for an ahad and another there's differences of opinion amongst marajah some say it's like an ahad so the heavy kafara or some like Ayatollah Sistani, they say that it's like the Yameen, so the lighter kafara. Okay, so now if we go to verse 224, it's basically saying, don't make a Yameen, don't make an, a, a swear, like don't make a pledge to not do something good. Okay, don't make Allah an obstacle in performing good actions. So the idea is that like somebody, let's say somebody was doing some good action, he was, I don't know, counseling people, giving money in charity, helping the poor, but because of the difficulties that he came, through, like he had to go through, he got so fed up, he made a qasam that, you know what, I swear by Allah, I'm never helping people again. So here Allah is saying, don't do that. وَلَا تَجْعَلُوا اللَّهَ عُرُضَةً لِأَيْمَانِكُمْ عُرُضَةً means like an obstacle. Don't make Allah an obstacle in in by by making an yamin ayman means the plural of yamin so by making these kind of promises that you're going to never basically do bir or have taqwa or tuslihu bayna nas reconcile people don't make allah an obstacle don't make such a promise that you're not going to do good things like that the next verse on the top of page 36 is saying uh, like I said, like all of the, uh, you know, in the Sharia, we have a lot of different chapters of fiqh that are known as uqud and iqa'at. So they're basically like transactions, you can say. Uqud is a two-way transaction, buying and selling, renting, giving like a a gift, for example, to somebody marriage where one party is initiating the marriage and the other person needs to agree these would all in the sharia be called uqud whereas iqa'at are one way okay it's just like uh, there's one, something called ju'ala where you you basically allocate prize money for anybody who does something it's a one-way thing there's nobody on the other side who needs to agree or divorce as we'll come to today divorce is a one-way thing in the sharia where the husband divorces Okay, normally, I mean, there's exceptions, there's different ways it can be done. So anyways, the idea is in the uqud and the iqa'at, one of the conditions is that you have to be serious in what you're saying and what you're doing. You can't, if you're just joking and you say, I've divorced my wife, it has no effect. Okay, so even here, I think that's what the verse is saying when it says, لا يؤاخذكم الله باللغو في أيمانكم that Allah will not call you to account. He will not hold you accountable for laghu. If you make a promise that wasn't serious, you weren't really like serious in what you were saying, it was just laghu. It was just something vain. But what he will call you to account for is ma kasabat qulubukum, what your hearts have earned. Apparently, like I said, apparently this is kind of indicating that an oath, a promise, a yameen that's made without really being serious is not going to be something that's binding upon you. Another last point I'll make about these is that a yameen is always makruh to do. So it's always not good to say, Wallah. If you're lying, it's a greater sin. It's, it's very, very haram. But even when you're telling the truth, it's not good to... Make a yameen. However, I don't think another is like that. Another, we have stories of the a'imma, stories of pious people who, when they wanted a certain hajat to be fulfilled, they made another to Allah. That, oh Allah, if this hajat of mine is fulfilled, I'll give this uh, amount in charity or I'll do this good, good deed, basically. Okay, so with that, let's move on if you guys don't have any questions. The next discussion, uh, before we come to the main discussion of divorce, is something very much related to divorce and also very much related to a yameen or an oath. 
which was a practice that the Arabs had in the days of Jahiliya before Islam, where a man would make an oath to not go close to his wife, basically. Okay? So it was a kind of punishment and torture on this poor wife where she wouldn't be like, you know, benefiting from being married in one sense and she would still be married. So she wouldn't be divorced and free to go and marry somebody else. So this is known as ila. So where a, a man makes an oath, he makes a yameen that I'm not going to have relations with my wife. So in, in Islam, this is discussed in the books of fiqh and in this verse of the Holy Quran, where basically in this situation, a woman can go to, like the, the fiqhi rule is that a woman can go to the hakim. Okay, a woman can go to the Islamic authority, the mujtahid basically. And the mujtahid can then say, okay, the man has four months. In these four months, he either needs to break his promise, which is good here. He's supposed to break his promise here. And, and also, this is an exception to that rule that I mentioned, that normally a promise, a yameen in Islam, is only valid if it's for something good. Right? Here, no, even though it's not something good, it has an effect and there are ahkam around it. So basically, he's supposed to break this promise and give the kafara and go back to a normal married life. But if he doesn't, he's supposed to divorce the wife. And if he doesn't, then the, the hakim, the mujtahid, can come and by force divorce the husband and wife. So basically this practice is what is being referred to. That لِلَّذِينَ يُؤْلُونَ مِن نِسَائِهِمْ Those people who do ila, That means that they do this, they make this yameen, they make this qasam, that they're not going to have relations with their wife. تَرَبُّصُ أَرْبَعَةِ أَشْهُرُ The Qur'an is saying here they should wait for four months. And then one of two things. فَإِنْ فَاءُوا فَإِنَّ اللَّهَ غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ If they go back to their wives, that's good. Allah is all forgiving and all merciful. Or if they decide to divorce their wives, then God is aware of what they're doing. Like, you know, that's not advisable. But at the end of the day, they have to pick one of these two. Either they return back to their normal married life or they divorce their wife. They can't leave the wife in this middle state where they are, not neither like you know married to her properly, nor are they letting her be divorced. Okay, with that now we enter this lengthy kind of discussion about divorce. Um, so a few points about kind of the ahkam of divorce. Like I said, in Islam, divorce is the prerogative of the husband. Okay, the default in the sharia is that it is the husband who has the right to divorce the wife. Another important thing to know is that we have two types of divorce. One is called rij'i. That is what is being referred to in some of these verses. The other one is called ba'in. The difference is that in the divorce that is rij'i, the husband can decide to take back the wife. Okay, there is a period of time after a divorce happens known as the idda. We'll talk about it, it'll come in these verses, the how long is the idda. In this period of idda, if the divorce was a rij'i divorce, at any time the husband can go back on his plan to divorce. He can decide that, no, you know what? I want to be married again, and he can take her back. Okay? Whereas if it's a ba'in divorce, then no, that's no longer the case. He doesn't have the right to take her back. There are different things that would make a divorce ba'in as opposed to rij'i. One of the differences is that if a man divorces his wife and then takes her back, and then divorces her again and then takes her back, the third time that he divorces her, it would be a ba'in divorce. So after that third divorce, he's no longer allowed to marry her again, unless there's uh, one situation where he is, which we'll come to in the Holy Quran. But yeah, overall, you know that like divorce is something that, whereas other religions, I believe the Catholic Church does not allow it, in Islam it is not at all recommended, it's very, very much frowned upon. But at the end of the day, the reality of you know the world and the way people are is that 
at times people cannot live together and so there is this aspect of the sharia where divorce can be done we actually have a hadith which is maybe not very authentic but we have a hadith of the fifth imam alayhi salam that uh, he was very much attached to one of his wives but one day he divorced her and when people asked her why asked him why did he do that he said that i mentioned amirul mu'minin alayhi salam in front of her and she cursed him and so i did not want that uh, my body touched like a piece of the fire of hell and so i divorced her but about the authenticity of had- this hadith there is doubt about it amongst the ulama anyways uh, so let's now go to these. Just a question on the first step first. Um, so the actual divorce is recited and he can take her back without remarrying her? Yeah, yeah. Within uh, a certain period or? You know, in the Idda time only. The idda. When the Idda finishes, then she's like, yeah, she's no longer under his. So in this period of Idda, in a Rij'i Talaq, the wife still has all of the ahkam of a normal wife. She, she's supposed to live in the house of the husband. She's not just not required to wear hijab, it's good for her to like dress, adorn herself. And so you know Islam is, it's, this is there in the Holy Quran that she should be there in the house of the husband. Uh, you know Islam is trying to somehow make it easy for them to get back together again. The husband still needs to take care of the wife, all of the expenses of the wife are still on the husband. Yeah, so in this verse that we're going to be reading now, there is this mention of matrimonial rights and how both the husband has rights that are on the wife and the wife has rights that are on the husband okay so this concept is there in islam definitely that both parties have certain rights on the other party both of them have a responsibility to the other one of the very important rights that the wife gets is this right of nafaqa Well, regardless of how much money the wife has, she could be rich herself. She could be earning money. Still, she has the right to demand that her husband take care of her expenses to the normal amount in society that is appropriate for the level, the class of society that they live in. Like, let's say they're from a noble, rich family, then up to that level... When it comes to like food and housing and clothing and all of these expenses, the husband has the responsibility to provide that. So even uh, in the period of idda, that's still the case. In in a talaq rij'i, the husband needs to still provide for all of these expenses. But at the end of the day, we have this that we're going to come to in this next verse, verse two hundred twenty-eight. Walil rijali alayhinna daraja. Okay, that at the end of the day, in the Sharia, men have been given a certain advantage over women. And that I really want to emphasize what I started with here, that that is not in any way to put down women, to demean women, to say that in the eyes of Allah, God forbid, a woman is lower. No, that's not the case at all. It's just when it comes to society, when it comes to family, the way that the structure has has been ordained by Allah is that Certain leadership roles have been given to a man. Okay, that's just the way the sharia is. And and there is wisdom in that. And we're also that's a test for us that like, you know, we need to submit to that even if we don't agree with it or accept it or understand it at times. Nonetheless, if there's no questions or comments or attacks, I can go into the translation of this verse. But feel free to give me feedback if anybody feels like, you know, there is feedback to be given. Okay, so verse 228 says, And the divorced women should keep to themselves in waiting. So basically this period of idda in a normal situation for a woman who's not pregnant, a woman who's more than nine, nine years old, a woman who had relations with her husband. She's not... Anyways, with, with different conditions, the period of idda is three quru. Now we have a discussion in fiqh that what does this word quru mean because in arabic quru could be used for a period of hayd or the opposite the period where the woman is not in hayd but generally fuqaha say it means the opposite not the hayd so three three periods of when a woman is not in the state of hayd need to be finished before the adda is finished so 
For example, one of the conditions of talaq is that the talaq can only be done in a period where the woman is not in hayd. Okay, so that first period, the one, one of the three would be that first one where the sirah of talaq was recited. And then the period of hayd would come, and then another period of purity, and then another hayd, and then a, a third period of purity, and then as soon as the thir third hayd is seen, third hayd, then, then that idda is finished. So that's what's intended by وَلِلْمُطَلَّقَاتِ يَتَرَبَّصْنَا بِأَنفُسِهِنَّ ثَلَاثَةَ قُرُوءٍ And then in this time, if the woman is pregnant, she's not allowed to hide this from the husband. It affects like the idda for a pregnant woman is the length and duration of her pregnancy. Even if it's only like a day, or even if it's nine months after the sigha of talaq is recited. So, so here she's not allowed to hide this. She needs to let her husband know, and that would also affect the, for example, you know, now the husband has nine months in which he can change his mind and decide to take her back. So that's what it's saying when well, it says, وَلَا يَحِلُّ لَهُنَّ أَنْ يَكْتُمْنَا مَا خَلَقَ اللَّهُ فِي أَرْحَامِهِنَّ إِنْ كُنَّ يُؤْمِنَّ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ It's not lawful for them that they should conceal what Allah has created in their wombs if they believe in Allah and the last day. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, if it was specifically because of a woman being pregnant or not, how comes now that the pregnancy can be tested by medical uh, means? Does the rule can be changed? Has it changed for people or not? Uh, so here, like the what matters is the testimony of the woman. Like I think that you. So basically, what would need to happen here is the woman would tell the family, tell the husband that she is expecting, mm -hmm. right? And so her word would be taken here, regardless of like the test or not. I think, but if the test is done, then that would give people certainty, right? Yeah. And then so but you I mean, can act on that certainty too. If Edda is there for life, like the woman is pregnant or not. Uh -huh, right. No, no, it's not, not it's not just for that. It's not just for that. Yeah. That definitely is one of the wisdoms behind it, but there's other reasons too, maybe that, you know, like to somehow respect the rights of the husband and to provide that time where the, they can be reconciled and easily get back together again. So then they're saying that in this period of idda, the husbands have a right to take back the wife, basically. They have more of a right, and their husbands have a better right to take them back in the meanwhile if they wish for reconciliation. And they have rights similar to those against them. Okay, وَلَهُنَّ مِثْلُ الَّذِي عَلَيْهِنَّ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ That the women have rights just as, like, for them, lahunna means in their favor there are certain rights. And alayhinna means against them there are certain, so in the favor of the husband, there are certain rights as well. Bil ma'roof. Bil ma'roof means like, you know, in an honorable, in a good way. But at the end of the day, like I said, you know, we have to, at times we can't be too apologetic and like, I don't think we should, uh, nowadays with, take care. Nowadays with the way that the Western world has so clearly become so full of problems and indecency and families how the family situation is going here as muslims we shouldn't feel like we're under attack you know we should we should i think uh, you know with strength and with honor we should stand up for the sharia and this is what the sharia has that that at the end of the day there is a difference between men and women as it says the men are a degree above them with that whole explanation that i mentioned Allahu Aziz and Hakim okay the next verse 229 is again talking more about divorce and how there are two times that you can do divorce meaning what meaning that this talaq rij'i is twice the third time it would be talaq ba'in in different verses of the Quran we have this concept that men are enjoined that look either treat your wife well or let her go you know imsakun bi ma'roof don't, don't torture her and, you know, keep her married to you and treat her badly. Then there's this point about how the husband cannot take the mahar back. Okay, so you know that part of the marriage agreement is the mahar that is given to the wife. 
initially it says that لا يحل لكم أن تأخذوا مما آتيتموهن شيئا You are not allowed to take any of that mahar back when you divorce your wife. However, there is an exception. There is something in the Sharia called talaq of khul'ah. Basically, khul'ah is when the wife really wants to get divorced. And so she basically gives an amount of money to the husband, which can be seen to be like the mahar that she's giving back, or it could be a different sum of money. Um, although I think in khul it's not allowed to be more than the mahar. I would need to check the ahkam. But basically that's what's being referred to here. فَإِنْ خِفْتُمْ أَنْ لَا يُقِيمَ حُدُودَ اللَّهِ فَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْهِمَا فِي مَفْتَدَتْ بِهِ That if the husband and wife are worried that they will not be able to live together in happiness and in accordance with the teachings of Islam, then there is no problem that the wife give some money to the husband to convince him to divorce her. And when that happens, talaq of khul is right away ba'in. Okay, so she basically convinced him to divorce her by giving money, and then he's now not allowed to just take her back. Tilka hudud Allah, these are the rules of Allah. Whoever, you know, goes beyond, transgresses the rules of Allah, then these are oppressors. Verse 230 at the bottom, bottom of page 36 is now saying this thing that once a man has divorced a woman three times, he's no longer allowed to marry her again. Unless she goes and marries another person. I don't know if this has ever happened in reality, but yeah, so three times if a man divorces a woman, then she goes and marries a, a third person. Then when he divorces her after they've had relations, then now the first husband is allowed to again marry her. Okay. Yeah. My understanding is that it can't be more than the mahar. It can be less than the mahar, but it doesn't have to be the exact amount, but it cannot be more. What if the mahar was enough money? Yeah, there's something else called mubarat as well. So they're both very similar, but in khulu, it's like just the woman is the one who wants to get divorced. Okay? I, I would have to double check these ahkam, but yeah, there's two two discussions there. One is called khulu, one is called mubarat. Yeah, I can I can look into this later and get back to you, inshallah, if you want. Okay, so now moving on to verse two hundred and thirty-one and two hundred and thirty-two on the top of page thirty-seven. It's basically, again, somehow trying to get rid of these cultures that were there prior to Islam, where the women were very much abused and everything was decided by the men. And the men, at times, the husbands would really torture their wives. So in verse 231, it's referring to this concept of some husbands would just like make a mockery of the law and they would divorce and make the woman wait for the entire period of the idda, and at the end of the idda, they would take the woman back. And then again, they would divorce her. And so she would be in this state where she's not really married, nor is she free to go and marry whoever she wants. So here it's saying, look, when this idda period finishes, then do one of the two things. Either amsikuhunna bi ma'roofin, either in an honorable, good way, be married to her, take her back, or let her be free. لا تمسكوهن ضرارا لتعتدوا. Don't hold on to this woman in such a you know mean way. Uh, do not retain them for injury is how it was translated. Oh, I have the translation of Shakir here. We open the translation of Quli Qarai. It says, "Do not retain them maliciously in order that you may transgress." So it's referring to this kind of idea of you know not letting her be free to be divorced and go marry someone else, but at the same time not re remaining married to her in a honorable way, in a nice way. Whoever does this has oppressed themselves. Do not make a mockery of the religion, basically. لا تتخذوا آيات الله هزوة. Do not take the signs of Allah in derision. And remember what a blessing it is that the Sharia was given to you 
you know, remember Allah's blessing upon you, what He has sent down to you of the book and wisdom to advise you therewith. Be wary of Allah and know that Allah has knowledge over all things. The next verse is very similar. It's saying that, okay, that was the previous verse, 231, was addressing the husbands that, you know, don't oppress your wives. Just let them be free or marry them and be with them nicely. The next verse is apparently addressing the men folk of the community, of the family, that don't stop the women who have been divorced to go and marry somebody else that they want to. Okay, so there, there are specific like cases in the life of the Holy Prophet ﷺ that happened where one of the companions, his cousin's sister got divorced and then she wanted to marry somebody else, but he didn't want her to marry that person. So he was becoming an obstacle. Here Allah is saying, no, when this happens, then فَلَا تَعْضُلُوهُنَّ أَن Don't stop them from marrying whoever they want. Or maybe it refers to here going back and marrying that first husband that they had. Yeah, I think that's what it's referring to. As it says in the English, do not hinder them from remarrying their husbands. Basically, the men of that family should not stop this woman from getting married as she wants to. Herewith are advised those of you who believe in Allah in the last day, and that will be more decent for you and more pure for you. Okay. So the next discussion, if there's no questions or comments. The next discussion is about like custody of the child or breastfeeding of the child. And so there's kind of two opinions here that do we understand this as an independent discussion on its own? Or do we understand it as kind of coming within the context of divorce? And it makes sense, the, the latter opinion, that this discussion really becomes a heated discussion when there was a divorce. And then the custody of the child now becomes an issue that who does the child remain with? And so I think I, I indicated this in one of the previous sessions. The common opinion of Shia Maraje is that, okay, everybody says that in the first two years, it is the mother that has custody of the child. In, in, there's one thing specifically about breastfeeding that is being referred to in this verse. But beyond that, in fiqh, we have a discussion on haqqul hadana, meaning custody, basically. Who is it that gets to keep the child? So up until two years, all the marajah would say that it is the mother that gets the custody. Beyond two years, we have differences of opinion. Again, the common Shia opinion is that a daughter up until seven years remains with the mother if she doesn't remarry. Okay, if she remarries, then even that seven years, she uh, doesn't necessarily have custody. But a son, after two years, it is the, in the custody of the father. Some maraja are give the woman the custody up until seven years, regardless of whether it's a boy or a girl. And the law in Iran, I was telling you guys, I think, is based on that opinion. Whereas some maraja like Ayatollah Sistani are even more like, uh, I think they say that even the husband, from regardless of whether it's a daughter or a son, after two years, the woman doesn't necessarily get custody. It needs to be somehow worked out. And the husband's desire cannot just be ignored basically after even between two years and seven years for a daughter so anyways there's differences of opinion and this in fiqh is a discussion called haqqul hadana and it is very much related to this verse so if we start reading this verse 233 mothers shall suckle their children for two full years that for such as desire to complete the suckling so if the mother and father want to complete the period of breastfeeding then the complete period, the maximum period that should be done is two years. And then it goes on to say that in this period, the husband, the father has to take care of the expenses. Okay, so even the, if there was a divorce, the husband needs to take care of certain expenses of the mother. I'm pretty sure that's what it's saying. Yeah. Okay. La nafsun illa wusaha. At the end of the day, everybody is going to be held into account by Allah based on what 
Allah gave them based on their capacity, based on their strength. The Sharia is never going to demand something of you that is beyond your strength and your ability to do. لا تضار والدة بولدها ولا مولود له بولده That neither the mother shall be made to suffer harm because of her child, nor shall the father be made to suffer harm. So basically the rights of both mother and father need to be held into account. And if, if the father has died, then it is the heir of the father. Let's say the father died and he left behind a son. Okay, the son needs to take care of the expenses of this mother basically yeah again i'm pretty sure that this is what uh, what what is being mentioned here now then it's saying that okay the uh, the complete period of breastfeeding is two years but if based on you know the situation seeking advice of doctors maybe the health of the mother the health of the child if they want to wean the child earlier then that's okay and if the couple desire to wean the child stop the breastfeeding with mutual consent and consultation, there will be no sin upon them. And if you want to have your children wet nurse, you know, give, give the child to another lady to breastfeed the child, then there is no problem. But again, there should be a kind of uh, agreement that is decided upon, that the woman will be given this much money for her service of breastfeeding that child. وَإِنْ أَرَدْتُمْ أَنْ تَسْتَرْضِعُوا أَوْلَادَكُمْ فَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْكُمْ If you want to give your children to a wet nurse, فَلَا جُنَاحَ عَلَيْكُمْ إِذَا سَلَّمْتُمْ مَا آتَيْتُمْ بِالْمَعْرُوفِ Meaning that you have to give her some money. Okay, You have to come to an agreement, an honorable agreement, where in return for feeding your child, you are giving her something. وَاتَّقُوا اللَّهَ هَفْ تَقْوَىٰ أَفَ اللَّهِ And know that Allah is all aware of what you do. Uh, undoubtedly, you guys know that in, in the Sharia, we have like discussion of mahram, who is mahram to somebody else. And one of the ways that people become mahram is through breastfeeding. If your child is breastfed by a lady for with certain conditions, then that child becomes like a member of that family. All, the mother and all of her family and the father who, who you know, like because of whom that woman had a child and had milk to give your child, is like the father of your child. So all of the family members of that family are now mahram to that child. So this is, this is a, a, I think up until recently, like nowadays things have changed maybe, but up until recently this was a very normal and very common practice that children would be breastfed at times by other women. So adopting a baby and then the wife breastfeeds the baby with that then... Yeah, yeah, yeah. That would make the child mahram. But specifically, adoption we have in the Quran that like, don't call that adopted child as your own child. In society, they shouldn't be known maybe as your child. It's a good, very good thing recommended to take care of an orphan, to help out, you know, this child. But it still should be somehow remembered that this is not your child and recognized as not your child. Okay. No, no comments or questions. Uh, a few more verses, yeah. Go ahead. Uh, going back to two twenty four, mm -hmm. uh, and not divorcing, kind of in vain or just saying it. Is that a consensus amongst uh, all Muslims? Um, two twenty five, I think, is what you're talking about, and that too, it was not about divorce. There, it was just generally about making an oath, making a qasam. That. Uh, that was about a qasam, but it's something that all, like all of the uqud and iqa'at, so for example, divorce, marriage, if it's just done without any real intention, it's not valid, yeah. And definitely in our fiqh, it's not valid. But I think maybe it's not so clear in Sunni fiqh, right? I, I remember somebody was once saying, like in Pakistan, there was a controversy about like a husband and wife who on film, on TV, they acted out a divorce. And then people are saying, no, now that you've done that, you're really divorced. So in, in our fiqh, definitely that wouldn't mean anything. If it was done as a joke, it would have no effect. Okay, just a few more verses. Uh, in verse 234, it's talking about this idda period now of the wafat. So a woman whose husband dies has a different rule of idda. So here, 
regardless of whether um, so th- there are certain situations where there is no idda for example a young ch- girl who's like 5 years old okay so she's not even baligha yet if she was married and that's another discussion that she can get married if she was married uh, and her husband divorced her there's no idda at all okay or a uh, husband and wife who never had relations if the husband divorces her there's no idda at all okay but here in this situation of the death of a husband regardless of like what kind of marriage it was regardless of whether the girl is young regardless of whether they had relations or not there is always going to be this idda period of 4 months and 10 days and beyond that Beyond the normal ahkam of idda, meaning that she's not allowed to get married again, there's something else that applies in this situation specifically. That is, uh, basically, the the woman is not allowed to adorn herself. Okay, I'm pretty sure it's called in Arabic, hidad. Just a fiqhi term that the woman in this period of four months and ten days, she's not allowed to do anything that would be considered a zinat. She's not allowed to dye her hair. She's not allowed to adorn herself in any way. So this is part of the ahkam of uh, the death of a husband. But that is what is being referred to in this verse, where it says, I'm pretty sure, I, don't know it, I didn't look it up right now, but I'm pretty sure it's called hidat in Arabic. So this verse 234, it's basically saying that, as for those of you who die leaving wives, they shall wait, these women shall wait by themselves for four months and ten days. And when they complete their term, so when this four months and ten days is finished, there will be no sin upon you <coughs> in respect of what they may do with themselves. Meaning what? Meaning the family of the deceased husband should not stop that woman from remarrying once the idda is finished. Okay, so she should be free to marry again. But once the idda period has finished. Uh, just quickly, since in the interest of time, on the next page, there is a very similar verse, verse 240. Apparently, a lot of ulama say that this is a verse that was abrogated by that previous verse that we just read. So whereas verse 240 is saying that the idda period of a woman whose husband dies is one year, that was abrogated, and the previous uh, verse that we just read, verse two hundred and thirty-four, I think, was the is the real rule, basically the final rule. So in verse two hundred and forty, it says, "Those of you who die leaving wives, shall bequeath for their wives, should leave money basically aside for their wives, without turning them out, for one whole year." So basically, this seems to indicate that the idda is one year, whereas that previous verse, which is what the ahkam are all based on, is that the idda is four months and ten days. And this is the uh, opinion, basically. This is the abrogating verse, the nasikh. That was the mansukh. Uh, the last point I'll make is that in verse 35 and 36 and 37, there is an interesting, so 235, 236, 237, there is a few other ahkam that are mentioned to do with divorce. Uh, one of them is that if a woman died... Uh, sorry, if a woman's husband died, so she's in the idda of wafat. It's not a problem necessarily for another man to desire to marry her. To even hint to her very honorably that, you know, like he's ready to marry her. But it shouldn't be like agreed upon, finalized until the idda is finished. Okay, there should be this kind of respect to the deceased husband by having the woman wait through the end of this idda period and not plan to get remarried so openly and quickly. Uh, and then there's a few other discussions in 236 and 237 about divorce if there were no conjugal re- relations that happened. So if there was a mahar that was agreed upon, for example, but then the husband divorces the wife before they had relations, then he just needs to pay half the mahar to the wife. Okay, This is another point that's mentioned. Anyways, we'll, we'll leave it at that. If you guys have any questions or comments, I can stick around. But it's 9 o'clock now, so let's wrap it up. Inshallah, we have two more sessions. Uh, continue in this way. 
uh, the last session, my father will come, inshallah, and somehow con conduct like a survey or get your feedback on how things went. Inshallah, I hope that it's of benefit to you, dear brothers and sisters. Wa sallallahu ala muhammadin wa alihi tayyibin al-tahirin.